This video lecture provides an introduction to treatment planning. It is recommended before you watch this video lecture that you have previously watched the introduction to case conceptualization, which informs this video lecture. Some definitions first. I had mentioned case conceptualization. Case conceptualization is defined as a map of the case how you understand the case, how you piece together various components to understand globally what is going on with the case. Whereas a treatment plan is a planned course of treatment. This is a sequential plan by which you articulate what issues you're going to address in what order. This has to do with planning interventions. It is uh, perhaps best characterized as a structured hierarchy of addressing the most pressing issues first, which is usually stabilization, followed by root issues and problems, more reliable or sustainable change, and lastly, how you will terminate therapy in the last two to three sessions, focusing on the gains uh, that you consider most important to highlight and reinforce. Here you see the flow between stabilization at first focusing on core issues second, and then concluding treatment in a way that reinforces gains you've already made. Some tips before we get into the specifics of treatment planning. Remember that treatment plans also include actions to be taken, such as referrals to other professionals, medical doctors for example, a career counselor if you're not doing that kind of work, a couples therapist if you want to refer out to them. The best treatment plans also directly address the primary diagnosis and outline the expected outcomes of treatment, meaning, as you'll see as we get to some examples, you should have already articulated what the primary diagnosis is before you start your treatment plan. If you do not have a primary diagnosis, it is very difficult to write a coherent treatment plan because treatment plans, by their necessity, directly address your diagnoses. So, when writing up treatment planning, the first section, which you'll see from your CCDTP template, or con Case Conceptualization Diagnosis and Treatment Planning template, has a section, section 2, which begins with problems, behaviors, or symptoms. This is essentially a repository for completing the later treatment plan. You're just listing out symptoms that you're going to be addressing. Underneath, you write your DSM-5 diagnoses. Goals should be clearly and concisely written here. When you get to the third section, which is starting to articulate a brief treatment plan for the case, you begin with goals. You would go through goals A, B, and C. Most goals will be collaboratively determined as an aside by the client and the counselor together, but for the sake of the treatment plans that you'll be writing for this class, you won't be meeting with a client formally, and so do your best instead to privilege the client's own self-direction as best as you can glean from the case. So as you read through a case in Ariadne's thread, for example, Try to be mindful of what kinds of goals the client may have for themselves based on the text. Goals should address the following issues. If you remember I mentioned there's an A, a B, and a C. You write in the goals first before you start filling out each of the sections. So just first identify goals. The initial goal should target the initial problems that are bothering the client. Ask yourself how can I help to stabilize the client? Think about the kinds of symptoms and the disorder that you've selected as the primary diagnosis that you can help to temper, uh, to alleviate, to provide some immediate relief to the client. Your subsequent goal is the long-term goal, the root problem goal, if you will. Here you want to target the core underlying issue, also known as root problem, Ask yourself what issues need to be addressed for the client's symptoms to not return, for there to be long-term sustained progress. As you'll see when we get into 
um, treatment planning, and as you've already understood from case conceptualization, there are problems, as an aside, that are more uh, surface level symptoms and other problems that are more core issues that will cause symptoms to return, meaning if you do not address the core underlying issues in the case, it is likely that even after stabilization that the symptoms will return. And that's why it's important to articulate what the root problems are and how they need to be addressed. The closing goal. Here you want to reinforce gains and highlight achievements by returning to goals addressed initially and subsequently. We do not introduce new goals here. Remember, the closing goal is really about the last two to three sessions and how we conclude a course of treatment. And so here, instead, we want to be focusing on what kinds of achievements has the client managed during their counseling thus far, and how can we help them to terminate counseling successfully by uh, uh, focusing, reinforcing those gains that they've already made. Here's a case example of a closing goal, just to give you a, a sense for what this might look like. If the initial goal is anxiety reduction, let's say the client's very anxious, and the subsequent goal is addressing deeper feelings of shame and guilt, so there are feelings of shame and guilt that are causing the anxiety symptoms, the closing goal should focus on coping with anxiety, shame and guilt because those are things that you've already focused on in treatment. The closing goal should not be something new, such as reduce depression, since that is not something that was worked on before now. The reason for that is when you introduce something new, like in addressing or reducing depression, that can cause treatment to extend for several sessions beyond those two to three sessions of closing. It's almost as if you are dumping the dragon, if you will. You're bringing in something huge that's new that will cause treatment to go on for several uh, months, certainly several more sessions. So you want your closing goal to be just really a summarization of what you've already achieved. Otherwise, it's not a closing goal. It's just another subsequent goal. Intervention should directly target the goals. This is important when you're starting to look at interventions. You've now got your goals and you're ready to start planning interventions. When you're planning interventions, look at your goals and look at how you would directly address them. Your intervention should also be consistent with your theoretical approach, which you had already articulated in your case conceptualization, and your initial interventions described in the case conceptualization. You don't introduce new information here. So if you've chosen, say, rational emotive behavior therapy as your theoretical approach, your interventions need to be consistent with that approach, and they need to be uh, uh, grounded in that theory. So you would choose something like the ABC analysis, for example, um, or the self-help form, which is used in REBT, as interventions rather than something outside of REBT. Expected results, also known as outcomes, should be clearly identified for each goal. It's really important when we're doing treatment planning that we're keeping the end in mind, as Stephen Covey would say from his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. We want to make sure that we are progressing through treatment with an understanding of markers for success, meaning we know when the client is ready to move to the next stage of treatment. If we don't have clearly identified measurable results, we don't know when the client is achieving um, success in the goals that we have established. So here we think about what improvements we want to happen based on our interventions. What would it look like if the client had made improvements? These are our expected results. The measurement section is one of the hardest or most difficult for students. It is also one of the most important since measurements are used to adjust the treatment plan. I had mentioned that uh, how important it is to make sure we have markers for success. Measurements are a large part of that. Here are some tips for selecting measurements. 
first ask yourself, how can I demonstrate progress using numbers? Numbers are very useful for demonstrating progress because they give us something concrete by which we can measure uh, progress. And it's very difficult to articulate to third parties, such as insurance companies, that progress has been made without numbers. So let's say you have a client, for example, who's, I don't know, in some relational problem with their spouse and their progress has been that they're getting along better with their spouse, that just doesn't sound uh, very convincing to an insurance company. The client is improving in their relationship with their spouse. Yes, but what does that mean specifically? You could say there, to use a number, the client reduced the number of arguments during the week from their spouse from an average of five to an average of one within a three-week span. That gives a much more understandable, quantifiable um, marker of success, and insurance companies understand that a lot better. So using numbers here can be very useful, and sometimes, as you saw in my prior example, you have to be a bit creative to use numbers. You have to think about what kinds of outcomes can I use numbers with. Use measures that match the diagnosis. If you're going to use psychological tests and assessments, you don't necessarily have to. As you'll see, frequency counts are very useful. But if you want to use a psychological assessment, it's really important that you select something that matches with the diagnosis. As an aside, when you take your licensure exam, the uh, National Clinical Mental Health Counseling exam, that exam will ask you specifically about assessment instruments in the case that you are assigned with and you are to basically identify the correct assessment instruments for the case, for the diagnostic uh, sense for the case. So no, understanding this now is useful to you later when you take that exam. I have here as an example the Beck Depression Inventory is a better measure for depression than the Beck Anxiety Inventory. So here we want measures that match the diagnosis. So we're thinking specifically about our diagnosis and how we can measure success based on the diagnosis. When we're using, using measure, measurements, we must avoid verbal self-report if we can because it is unreliable. If we must use self-report, we use standardized self-report measures, and this is where psychological assessments come in play. These are still self-reports, they still have limitations, but they are uh, perhaps a bit more rigorous and robust than just um, the client's own verbal reporting. So the Beck Depression Inventory or Anxiety Inventory, the Outcomes Rating Scale, Session Rating Scale, and the DSM-5 Level 2 measures, which you will find in the uh, blackboard shelf. These are all very useful to use um, when you are looking at measurements and you need something for a self-report tool. Scaling can also be used to quantify self-report and it's very commonly used uh, in the field, not only the field of counseling but just the field of mental health in general. For example, in the nursing profession they use pain scaling fairly frequently in medical settings and also in mental health settings. Scaling is uh, very easy to use. You use a, usually uh, something like a 1 to 5 or a 0 to 10 scale and you ask the client to rate their level of anxiety, depression, um, readiness for change, whatever it is, and to get a sense for, of numbers there. Again, it's prone to self-report bias, so it's not the most reliable, but it is useful if you want to attribute numbers to something and you're not sure how to do that. A preferred approach to measurement is tracking behavior via frequency counts. While still self-reported data, frequency counts tends to give a better sense for the week than a verbal report because the client is usually asked to track that each day and they write that down before they forget and therefore it gives a just better sense for how the week went. You can track behavior on charts or sheets by frequency, duration, and intensity. I'm going to give you some examples of each. An example of frequency, uh, it can include number of alcoholic drinks in a day. This is someone who wants to uh, cut down on their drinking. 
number of suicidal thoughts in a week, someone who's suicidal, number of panic attacks in a month, someone who experiences panic attacks on not quite a weekly basis, but certainly a monthly basis. So that's frequency. Duration, time length of drinking episodes when they occur. For example, all day versus a few minutes, that's quite different. Time length of suicidal thoughts when they occur, whether they are what's called um, uh, fleeting or whether they are uh, thoughts that stay with the person. The time length of panic attacks when they occur. Time length of panic attacks is also very important. Most of the time they don't last for more than a few minutes and that in itself is an intervention for the client because they realize after tracking their panic attacks that wow actually this isn't nearly as bad as it seems in the moment because psychological time and real time are quite different sometimes and when you're in the middle of a panic attack it can seem to last for hours when it only lasts for a few minutes. So we looked at examples of frequency and duration. Now let's look at some examples of intensity. Here we look at the frequency, uh, sorry, the severity of drinking episodes. For example, there's a difference between tipsy, drunk, whole weekend bender. Those things are quite different. So we want to know how bad the drinking episode got. The severity of suicidal thoughts, whether we're talking about mild, transient, moderate, persisting, severe, with command auditory hallucinations, how bad do they get? The severity of panic attacks, are we talking about mild, which is minor ch chest discomfort without shaking, moderate significant chest discomfort and tremor, and severe unbearable chest discomfort with tremor and inability to stop episode. So here you can see there are quite different levels of severity, usually we look at mild, moderate and severe. And you can use the, the frequency, duration, and intensity to understand the exact um, uh, shape in which uh, the behavior is occurring. It can be very useful when looking at progress over the long term because you may find, for example, that a person's frequency of, say, panic attacks remains constant, but the severity of them significantly decreases, and that's good information for you to know. If you don't gather, gather both sets of data, you may think that the person's panic attacks are not changing at all because the frequency has stayed the same if you're just collecting the information on frequency or if you're just collecting information on intensity you may think the clients are making huge gains because the intensity has really decreased but the frequency of which they're occurring has remained constant so you want both kinds of data we're now going to go through a case example using the video case that was explored in the case conceptualization video lecture to understand how we would plan a course of treatment for an actual client. So in the case example of Duncan, first we look at what symptoms must we address first to stabilize him. Now if you recall, D Duncan was diagnosed in the case with post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. So in terms of symptoms that we must first address to stabilize Duncan, we would probably be aiming to address some of his dissociative symptoms because those impacted his work performance, if you recall. We may also be looking at some of his avoidance and numbing symptoms because he talked about some of his interpersonal contact with others and how that was quite difficult for him um, to engage with others in trusting relationship because he doesn't want others to be hurt by him as his girlfriend was. So those are some initial symptoms that we could target that are consistent with PTSD. What is the root issue next that w must be addressed for Duncan to make a long-term recovery? Well in Duncan's case it's apparent that he's experiencing some grief and loss and in addition to that a significant amount of guilt and regret for his uh, drunk driving which led to the death of his girlfriend. So here we want to be addressing the grief and the loss as well as some of the cognitive elements to the case which tend to be perpetuating his own sense of for example low mood, despondency, perhaps even depression. So those would be the root issues that we would be tackling. How would you terminate therapy in the last two to three sessions? What gains are the most important to highlight and reinforce? This is the closing goal. So in the closing goal, we want to make sure that 
Duncan has the tools to be able to handle his dissociative episodes at the best way he can and also be able to trust others, have some sense of um, how he could do that um, to not be so reticent. And then we also want to make sure that Duncan's guilt and regret, in addition to his grief and loss, are worked through and processed so that by the time he concludes treatment, he isn't ca carrying a very heavy burden of what has happened, or at least has made some headway into an acceptance of the event without chastising himself in a really unhealthy way, because, uh, you know, horrible things do happen, but we have to be able to learn from them, move on from them, and um, engage in healthy behaviors that, that really honor the memory of the person who has left us. So those are just some brief examples of an initial goal, a subsequent goal, and a closing goal. Let's look at the flow of treatment planning. So now that we've got goals, what do we do about them? There are many approaches to treatment planning that take a slightly different road to the same outcome. So we're going to be now applying theory to those goals using CBT and person-centered. So CBT first, and then I'll show you person-centered next. With CBT, remember we have an initial goal that is to work on his dissociative episodes and to also help Duncan with trusting others. With CBT, we would probably be focusing more on the dissociative episodes uh, because it, we could certainly work on the trust piece and helping him to have uh, uh, changed some of his cognitions around trust but perhaps his dissociative episodes are more important to us because we're worried he's going to lose his job. So we would give him some tools with CBT, and CBT is very useful for teaching tools, things like grounding techniques, mindfulness, things that help Duncan to stay in the moment rather than dissociate and become lost in either flashbacks or um, uh, just zoning out for you know, minutes at a time. So that would be our first approach to the initial goal. The subsequent goal, this has to do with grief and loss on one hand, and then guilt and regret on another. CBT could be quite useful for the guilt and regret piece, so let's focus on that for now. Because guilt and regret is a uh, cognitive uh, uh, appraisal of a situation. We feel guilt and regret based on how we have appraised our own behavior. So we would work with Duncan on considering uh, basically what he could have done in that situation and how he thinks about what had happened in terms of his own responsibility there and what he learned and teaching him to have more positive self-talk and to honor the memory of the deceased as I had mentioned. So there we would work on cogn uh, uh, Duncan's cognitive appraisal of the situation for his subsequent goal. For his closing goal, remember we have now worked on dissociation and we've also wor worked on guilt and regret. We would want to make sure that Duncan is able to be functional, meaning he's able to work a job and not lose his job. We also want to make sure that he isn't uh, held down by just significant feelings of guilt and regret that are hard for him to move on, move past. So we want to reinforce those. So in the closing goal section, we would have Duncan continue to practice some of his um, uh, grounding skills, some of his mindfulness skills, while processing his guilt and regret and uh, developing a long-term plan post-therapy for how he will prevent relapse, how he'll prevent himself from falling back into dissociative episodes or falling back into negative patterns of uh, self-talk related to guilt and regret. This can take a variety of forms. It may well be that Duncan uh, continues practicing certain skills or continues to keep a diary or a log um, or whatever it is, or maybe even has some check-ins with you on, say, a quarterly basis to make sure that he is still making good progress. That would be an example of a closing goal. Uh, 
using the CBT framework. Again, notice how the closing goal is really just reaffirming what we've already accomplished. Person-centered. Let's look at applying person-centered to the case of Duncan. So our initial goal with person-centered, since we've already uh, looked at dissociation and we had also mentioned the possibility that Duncan is not trusting others or feels unable to trust others, from a person-centered theoretical approach, we might work with Duncan on establishing the therapeutic relationship as a method by which Duncan can start to open up to important others in his life and trust others uh, with sharing his deep thoughts, inmost thoughts and feelings, and uh, starting to just open himself up to relationships more broadly. Person-centered is a perfect match for this, of course, because establishing the therapeutic relationship is a major part of person-centered, if you look at the three core conditions. Subsequently, we had mentioned two issues, one of which we've already ad addressed, which is the guilt and the shame or the regret. We may also want to address with Duncan the sense of grief and loss that he feels. Now, in a person-centered framework, we wouldn't necessarily lead the client into this, but when the client was discussing his feelings about the event, we would help the client stay there via use of uh, reflection of feeling, for example, and refl reflection of meaning to help the client more deeply feel and experience and process, work through some of his own guilt and loss, uh, uh, sorry, grief and loss related to losing his girlfriend. So that would be the subsequent goal that we would work through. And we could even say that if Duncan is not able to process that grief and loss, it will be difficult for him to open himself up to trusting others in the future. And so it's important for us to work on the subsequent goal. Our closing goal in this situation is going to be two things. Number one, to ensure that the client is becoming more open and trusting with others. And then second, to make sure that the client has processed some of his grief and loss. So those two things would be worked on probably by helping the client to talk about the relationship he has with his therapist, how he has been able to open up, and what that has meant to him, and also um, just by so using some non-directive listening techniques, helping the client to process what kinds of gains he has made in terms of his own grief and loss reactions, what it's been like for him to talk about his grief and loss in therapy, and how interpersonal contact with the therapist has not only improved his sense of trust in others, but also helped him to regain a sense of control over some of his relationships and a realization that he still matters to other people and can continue to matter to other people and can honor again the memory of the deceased by having meaningful relationships with others in his life. So that's an example of how you would use person-centered in the case, slightly differently than CBT, but you notice here that you are following the same diagnosis throughout and treating different symptoms of the diagnosis, but you're still working on kind of comparable goals there just through a different theoretical lens. The theoretical spectrum is something that you had seen in your Introduction to Case Conceptualization video lecture. I want to return to this just briefly because uh, I want to highlight to you that you can take any theoretical approach to these cases that you wish, and all of them are correct, all of them are useful. Some are more useful than others in uh, some situations, but in most situations they're all useful. It's just in, if you're going to be selecting a theoretical approach, what I want you most to do is to think about how you want to work with that client. Do you want to work with that client on more specific, concrete, short-term objectives that are more structured, perhaps more psychoeducational, or more general, global, long-term objectives that are less structured and more process-based? Some of this is going to depend on the client's presenting issues, for example, their diagnosis. Some of it's going to depend on your own orientation. What I want you to think about, though, is when you're selecting a theory and trying to implement it, 
to make sure that you are thinking clearly about the diagnosis and how you're going to help the client uh, resolve some of the themes that come up from the symptoms they have and also some of the root issues. And so that's how you select theory. And this spectrum helps you because as you're starting to kind of consider what theories to use, it's useful to think about whether you want something that is more structured or less structured based on the client. Okay, theoretical integration. I had mentioned in the introduction to case conceptualization lecture, video lecture, that theoretical integration is very difficult to do well. The reason is it becomes a lot more complicated as you'll see. Some approaches are more easily integrated than others and the prior chart helps us understand why because there are some approaches that are more comparable based on how structured they are uh, versus others which are if they're if you have a very structured and a very less structured uh, theoretical approach those can be quite difficult to integrate well. So I'm going to pick two approaches that are quite different just to show you how difficult it can be to integrate uh, two different theories. Um, and this will help you understand why I don't recommend integrating unless you are integrating two alike theories and feel really strongly about knowing how you'll do that. So we're going to try integrating con cognitive behavior therapy with solution-focused brief therapy and then cognitive behavior therapy with person-centered therapy in the case of Duncan. So in the case of Duncan before, I'd used CBT and person-centered separately. I showed you two different versions. If we were to integrate those, maybe we'll start with CBT and person-centered. I'll show you what that would look like. Remember, our initial goals were two things. One was to help him with dissociative episodes. The second was to help him with trusting others. So we would use CBT and person-centered in this way. CBT would be used for the dissociative episodes. Person-centered would be used for the trusting piece. Now the difficulty with using those at the same phase of treatment, the same initial goal, is that you run the risk of, in one session, being very non-directive, being very reflective in your listening of Duncan and helping establish the therapeutic relationship and his trust in you. Yet at the same time, you're going to be giving him tools, some grounding exercises, for example, for dealing with dissociative episodes. And that's going to feel a lot more directive, meaning you are teaching instead of listening. You need to be very careful uh, about informing the client about your, that shift in your approach. Otherwise, the client will be confused. They won't uh, understand why you're listening at one point and why you're becoming much more active at another. Um, so you have to directly address with the client how you're going to integrate those in the same phase of treatment by talking about how at times I'm going to be more listening to you, more establishing our relationship, at other times I'm going to be teaching. The important thing here is that you're being direct with the client about that, that you tell them about that, and that in your case conceptualization section, if you're going to be integrating in that way, that you at least include one sentence about that, that you write that you're, how you're going to integrate those two approaches in the same phase of treatment by articulating to the client how you are going to be different during different sessions. So that's the initial goal. Subsequent goals with CBT and person-centered, if you remember, we were working on his guilt and regret as one part of that goal, and also on his grief and loss. So the guilt and regret, we would use CBT to um, help the client process their own cognitive appraisal of the situation. And in terms of grief and loss, we would use reflective listening with some reflection of content, meaning, feeling especially, to help the client process their own um, uh, emotional response to the loss. Now, those things are also difficult to integrate for the same reason, because working on changing a person's cognitions is a fairly directive technique, meaning you are going to challenge and confront the client at times and educate the client as well. In contrast, using uh, reflection of feeling and content and meaning 
all of those are fairly non-directive techniques and so the client again needs to know that you're going to take different stances based on the session and perhaps even in the same session you might be using switching between those the client will be confused if they don't know that that's your intentional approach so you need to be fairly formal about articulating to the client how you are doing that and why you're doing that closing goals remember this was to reinforce those gains and we've had some gains now with a lot of different areas if we've taken both approaches because we've not only stabilized the client with their dissociative episodes we've also established trust in others through our relationship with them we've also helped Duncan to work through some of his guilt and regret and some of his grief and loss all of that is very difficult to summarize in a closing goal and you may need several sessions, maybe even four or five, to be able to really make sure that the client has an excellent plan for how to continue their work post-discharge, post-termination of therapy. So you'd have to very carefully articulate how you would do that. For example, you may well focus with the client in one strand, let's take the person-centered strand first, on how the client has uh, developed a relationship with you and a trust in you and how that has helped them to uh, believe that they are capable of learning from the grief and loss that has occurred and honor the memory of the deceased by um, establishing other important interpersonal relationships and treating others the way that they would like them to be treated that person who is deceased would like to be treated so you can see here how that's one strand and you could reinforce that the other strand would be the dissociative episodes and then the feelings of guilt and regret and you could make sure that the client has a good um, plan for practicing grounding and breathing and mindfulness techniques during dissociative episodes and also has a plan for how they're going to continue with their positive self-talk perhaps it's a journal of some kind so that's more of the CBT strand and you would make sure that the client has addressed both strands uh, at their termination so you can see here that the treatment is more complex when you have two theoretical models I could show you CBT with solution focused brief therapy um, I think I'll probably for the sake of time uh, pause on that but it might be useful for you to do your own homework and to just think about how you would uh, using the same goals that we had talked about so far use CBT and solution focused brief therapy what that would look like between each of those phases initial subsequent and closing goals and how you could articulate to the client how you're making a shift between those and that concludes the video lecture on treatment planning or introduction to treatment planning